All right. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about design considerations. So when you're designing something, some of the things you need to look at, which we'll continue talking about all semester when we talk about individual processes, but <clears throat> we're looking at mainly designing it so it's easy to make, designing it so it's easy to assemble, designing it so it's easy to take apart and then get rid of at the end. So those three things, and that's kind of, the book calls it design for quality, but it includes all that, all those things. If you design it so it's easy to make, you're going to make it better. Design it so it's easy to put together, you're going to put it together better. It's going to be a higher quality product at the end. <coughs> um, here's a little example. If you had this, starting out, you've got how many parts to make? You know, you've got three different parts to make, right? Because you're using two of the same part. And then you've got a bunch of fasteners to buy. So you've got a lot of material. You've got to make those. And then you've got to put them in. You've got to align them, right? So how do you keep those two holes lined up so they, that raw will go in, right? You've got to take some time to make sure they're lined up. Or make those holes really tight. Then if it's too tight, then it won't fit. If it's too big, then it moves around too much but it always fit. So one way, make it so you just bend those walls up. That way you know that it's going to be aligned. <clears throat> and then you can just put something else to hold the, the rod in. Or incorporate it into that same part. So now we're down to two parts with no fasteners. It just snaps in and it's centered, it's positioned right, right off the bat. So by changing the design of something, you make it so that it probably takes the same amount of time to make this as it did those parts, maybe even less, right? <clears throat> but now you don't have those other extra parts to make. And putting it together, you just go snap instead of having to line up a bunch of washers and screws and nuts. So what was so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today, okay? So manufacturing, assembly, service is another one we want to do. So what does manufacturing, manufacturing is designed for a service mean? How easily is it to take care of? Yeah, to, to fix, right? So if I'm designing a car, do I make it that I can slide the transmission out the side without taking the engine down? Or do I not look at that and make it so you have to disassemble the actual uh, mounting uh, blocks for the engine, not just unbolt it from the frame, but pull the pin and disassemble it. So, bad design for service makes things take a lot longer to fix. Um, and then, design for disassembly or just design for destruction or design for end of life is another term that they use for that. Okay? So, what are some things we should look at when we're designing for manufacturability? What? What did you say? When we're designing for manufacturability, what are some things we should look at when designing it so it's easy to make? Materials. Yeah, what materials we're using. <clears throat> but what materials are you using? What are their capabilities, right? Can you give me any examples? Yeah, steel versus aluminum. How does it, does it do stuff with it? If we're doing sheet metal stuff, you can do some things with steel sheet metal that you can't do with aluminum sheet metal. And how sharp you bend it. Aluminum, you need a little, little bit more of a radius than steel. What else? design it so it's, because if we do the design to make it easy to make, then the cost will come. But what are some other factors we should look at when we're designing it? What are we talking about in this class, mostly? Different machines that you're going to design them Yeah, our processes, right? 
what processes are we going to use to make this thing? Or can we use to make this thing? Because <clears throat> that'll determine kind of how it should look. And that's going to be a major theme throughout the classes. If we're going to make it by welding, what do we do? Or if we're going to make it by injection molding, how, did, how should that part change? What's its capabilities? What materials can be used? How's it going to affect the overall look and quality? Because we can't... If this needed to be something that was really big and bulky, could we have changed it to that? If, like if this, these sides were quarter inch, could we have made that same change? Maybe. Where it just snaps in? With finishing metal, you can bend it pretty easy, right? Put a tab on it. If that was a quarter inch steel, could we just do that same thing? Probably not, right? Not so, so, and then also if we're going to mill it, that has some specific parameters. Um, so when we're designing something, so is that a good part? Could I make that real easy? Yeah. Yeah. Look at the details of the part. Can you make a sharp inside corner? Sharp inside corners are really hard. Because tools don't have sharp outsides. They have some, a little bit of chamfer, a little bit of filled on it, so that the tool lasts longer. Because the sharp point on the tool is going to wear off. <clears throat> so they've always put it in a little chamfer or a little fillet. So it would be better to put a fillet or a chamfer in there. So now the tool can cut it easier. And you can use a bigger tool. So if I had a a quarter inch here, I could use a quarter inch, or a, if this was a quarter inch fillet, I could use a half inch mill to run down and do that and take off that much material. Then I could do this with something that's even bigger. If that was going to be a sixteenth of an inch fillet, because I can only use an eighth of an inch in mill there, if I was going to mill that out. And that's mean I'm going to have to do a lot more passes in here to get it cleaned up. <clears throat> so changing little parameters like that, uh, changing the sheet metal like I said last week. <clears throat> Can't do something like that. Shorten this or make that longer. Or else we have to buy special equipment to make the cost go up. <clears throat> what else? Anything else? So that's kind of it. But there's a lot of things included in that process, right? So we'll talk about that more throughout the semester. So what about design for assembly? Where are some good keys here? Yeah, make mistake proof. Mistake proof. Yeah, so keep it simple. Make it so that they can only put it in one way. They can't put it in backwards. It just kind of goes in and it goes in there. What else? What kind of goes along with making mistake proof? There's a lot of other things kind of included in that. Mistake proof. What would make something easy to put together? Fewer parts. Yeah, fewer parts. And maybe fewer different parts. If you had something that had to have screws and things, maybe making them all the same screw if you could. Instead of five different types of screws you have to go searching through. You know, you buy furniture like that, you can buy something you have to put together. You've got a bag of like 30 different types of screws. Some of them are different by an eighth of an inch. It's like, why can't you just use a shorter one for all of them? Or drill that hole a bit a little deeper and use a deeper one for everything. And then make it three screws or something like that. 
What else? <coughs> or when you're putting the parts together. It only goes together one way, so you can't put it together wrong, the wrong way. Make things self-locating, so um, you're not trying to line something up. Just kind of, you're not having to figure out. Okay, I'm going to put it over measure. It's going to overlap by this, and put it in like that. Make it so that it, there's something to stop against there. So, like if I had a plate, and I wanted this plate to overlap it. That'd be a lot of setup, right? I'd have to make sure I got that me that measured and me make sure I got that measured. But if I had some kind of a stop here or a stop here or a notch that I could put something in to help a line up against, wouldn't that be a lot easier? <clears throat> make it so that there's there's notches for things. There was an episode of How and How Tech. Well, I can't find that episode anywhere. Um, but they showed they put together this little firefighting robot thing. And the engineer that designed it made it so that they cut out all the pieces on the water jet, and then they just kind of stuck it together. It had little some male, some male bolt uh, things, and then they had some holes on here, and they just kind of fit together. So they just kind of stuck it all together. It left spaces to weld, and so there was no measuring, nothing. When they just kind of picked it up, stuck it together, just welded it together. They didn't have to try and align anything real precisely because it was all it had to go that way. <clears throat> Anything else? Wasn't there like twelve things on that list? What? Yeah, use good tolerances. Use appropriate tolerances. So how do we use good tolerances? What, what does that mean? Is that the stress level? No. What's a tolerance? Clearance. No. Clearance is involved in the tolerance, but not what the tolerance allowance. is. Allowance? Yeah, it's the allowance. So it's the uh, allowance during manufacturing. Yeah, so it's how much you're allowed to, to be off, right? Or it's not really how much you're allowed to be off, but just kind of what, what's acceptable, right? The holes yeah, has a maximum size and minimum size it can be. And then, so where do you want to be within that? Kind of depends. But you can do it where you can specify that if the hole gets bigger, can it move around a little bit more? Should it be able to? Yeah. Yeah, it should be able to move around a little more. What lets us do that with tolerances? There's a type of tolerance that lets us make it so that if a hole gets bigger, you can, it can, the position can change more than if it's smaller. Nope. Or if a line needs to be parallel, it needs to be parallel, but it can still move up and down within the tolerance. So we can change how we tolerance to make it so it's more manufacturable. But still keep what we want to do. G, D, and T. The geometric dimension tolerancing. So you're, you got a little bit of it in 44. You'll get more of it, a lot more of it in 5. And we're going to do a little bit of some of how to put it into Inventor in 4C. So using GD and T makes it so that you can more accurately, accurately tolerance the part for what you want it to do. So that parts that you could be made good can be made good. So if you aim to make all your holes as small as they can be, and it's off position, you just drill it out until it's the right size to be an acceptable part. You don't have to make them middle size and then if it's off, just throw it away. Now you can fix it and make it a usable part. Make it so they can go back together good. <coughs> um, what else?
all it's going to do to make it easy to assemble. We've got to reduce the total number and the total number of different parts, make mistake proof, use good tolerances. Um, make it so that things can kind of, you don't have to reach around things to assemble things. You can kind of push, just put things in from one direction, right? What else? Fewer connections. Yeah, fewer connections between mm -hmm. things. Connections, what else? Let's look at these desks. <clears throat> How would you put together these desks? They, they came pretty well, so the assembly just kind of went. There wasn't really any problems to it. I mean, we got down to doing a whole assembly on our desk and like five minutes, five, ten minutes. <laughs> so what, what, made, what made it so we could assemble one of these desks in less than ten minutes? <laughs> yeah, sub assemblies, right? So we've got the whole bottom leg the sub assembly, it's got two tops, and actually those came as one big sub assembly. So we had two legs, we had the two tops, or the three tops, the back connection, and then the hinges underneath, and a couple crossbars, and that was it. <clears throat> and so it was real easy to kind of put it together. Everything was lined up with holes. Um, on these back pieces, there's actually a piece that can kind of see it from the side. There's a boss sticking out that's welded on the tube. That, so on this piece, we just kind of stuck it on there. And it would support the desk without even screwing it in. So we kind of put it there, we could stand it up, then we could screw it in. Um, under the other side of the, the tabletops, we didn't have screws going into wood. Um, for the most part, for all the connections to the, to the frame, we were going into, into T-nuts. So they had good threads, it was nice and easy to go into. Um, so it was kind of just set it on, line it up, put it together. You don't put the threads on. What? You don't uh, break the threads on. Yeah, you, didn't, you didn't have to worry about going too far and, and stripping out the wood or anything. So you just let the clutch and head at it. Um, so some assemblies, making some parts that you just put, put some assemblies together. So when we're doing a packet of drawings, there's some people that'll, I don't know, some, not really, in the industry it doesn't happen, but sometimes you, you learn in the books and stuff, you just do all the parts and you just do an assembly at the end. And some software will tell you kind of do that. But the better way is to figure out what sub assemblies you want. And that way when you, you're doing it, you can put sub assemblies kind of how it's going to go together. And this project is the 4C project and it's got like to make the little handle here if you look at it it's actually four parts and it's three sub-assemblies I think or two sub-assemblies to get to that final product with four parts. This goes, okay we're going to put these together now we're going to go do another step put these together. So if you make some assemblies, then those are, maybe if you make two different things. So if we were doing desks, we could make, make this desk and make a bigger desk also, right? What would we have to change? Yeah, we'd have to change this part, that part, the back sub assembly, and these two cross members, of some, right? But the legs, same exact thing, right? So those legs could be used on both products without any changes. So the manufacturer can make a ton of those legs at one time, half of them for this product, half of them for the bigger one. 
and then the, the dash that it just be able to cut the size that they need. Okay? So kind of you're reusing a part from another existing product, not just trying to stock something new, something different. Okay? Any other things? Okay, so some things to look at when we design for service. Yeah, how's it easier to take it apart to get to things that would probably need servicing? How hard is it to take it apart that you can Yeah. Is it something that's going to break easy that you're going to take apart the whole engine for? <coughs> um, yeah. So, kind of like, like the transmission. Because if it was easy to slide out, it would be an hour job. Because it's not, it's a six hour job at a, at a shop. You do it on your own, it's an eight hour job. Even if you have all the tools and someone knows what they're doing. Because you have to take part every little piece. But if not, slide out, no problem. Um, same thing with like printers, right? The design printer, so you can get in there, you can usually find out where the jam is and clear it now. So a lot of newer printers, you open it up, you can pretty much take out the whole inside real easy. Put it all back in and stop it going again. Old printers, you got a jam in there somewhere, you had to call tech, you had to come in, spend all day taking it apart, putting it back together, and then maybe you got the jam. Maybe you fix what caused the jam. But now it's like, okay, just pull it out, put it back together. Okay? So take it apart. So what else? Getting replacement parts. Yeah. How easy is it to get replacement parts, right? Is there somewhere that they can go to get replacement parts easily, or do you have to have a custom, a custom part remade um, for it? What else? Fixing it, it's safe, right? My car is the epitome of this, or the antithesis of this, the opposite of design for service. A lot of cars are. To get the alternator out, I had to take off the oil filter and still barely squeeze it by. And in the process, I had cuts going up and down both arms. Because so I had to reach in, try and get it out. It is not, not done well. If they had rolled the edges of, of the bodywork or of the frame, no cuts. But they, that I've left sharp edges and the shimmy will just kind of fold over like that. No no plastic, no trim, nothing on it. And parts in there, same thing. <clears throat> okay. Any other things? Yeah, easy access. Well they're not fasteners, could be reused. Yeah, reuse fasteners. Whether or not the fastener is going to stay attached or not, <clears throat> right? So you, get, you take it apart. You got a little tiny screw. You get it out, and it drops, right? Has that ever happened to you guys? Yeah. And then it's stuck down there somewhere, and you can't get it out. You have to like small enough you can pick it up and shake and try and get it out. In the meanwhile, breaking something else, <clears throat> or that screw just stays down there, and you have to try and figure out what size it was. So what's something else in there, right? Um, so 
reaching it so that it's easy, it stays attached maybe, so using a captive fastener, or using it that'll just pop out really easy, that's still easy to hold on to once you take it out. Standard tools. Yeah, use standard size stuff. Um, designed so you use one wrench for everything. Kind of goes back to the to using the fewer number of parts, right? You got screws, bolts, the, 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 especially like hex bolts, the head is directly related to the size of the bolt. You change one, you change the other. Unless you get a custom one with a custom size head. So if by using the same size fastener, now you only have to use one wrench. <coughs> or um, if you're using um, Phillips, use the same number of Phillips driver for everything. So you're having to switch between one that's real broad and one that's real narrow. Uh, like that. What else? So now designed for disassembly. Disassembly, end of life, destruction, it all fits into the same thing. I think there's an article in one of those design worlds on design for destruction. There's a really good long article. Yeah. How easy to take apart when you're all done with it, right? And And what do we mean by take it apart? Dismantle. Yeah, dismantle. They take all the pieces, okay, all the material, there are different types of materials. So if you've got all the plastic on the outside and all the metal on the inside, it's really easy. You just take the outsides off, put it off to plastic recycling, take the metal, set it off to metal recycling, right? You don't necessarily have to take all the pieces apart sometimes. But maybe if there's something that's inside, like circuitry, then you need to be able to pull that out to recover other materials from that. Um, or maybe there's something that you can reuse from it to service something. So, like alternators and stuff like that, right? When you buy a new one, you just give them back your old one, right? Yeah. They, they kind of make you give them back your old one. What do they do with it? it. Yeah, they take it back, they take it apart, it fix it, and sell it for the same price you just bought a new one for. Right? Or, or remanufactured, but that's usually what you buy. You hardly ever buy a new anything when it's, when it's like that. So you, you pay 170 bucks, you give them your old one, they do a little bit of work to it, they sell it back to someone else for 170 bucks. So, but they just kind of, they rewrap the wires, and make your things nice, but the casing, perfect. They didn't need to do anything to that, usually, right? They just put up changes the stuff on the inside. Change out a couple of the brushes and stuff, off it goes. Just kind of reusing stuff, so that's really good recycling, right? They didn't even have to melt it down, they just repackaged it. They even told me to bring back the box. Because they're going to reuse that box for someone else, too. So, what else? safe to take apart, um, or you set it to the right place to be taken apart to a certain level, right? Circuit boards, you can't just pop it off. You want to recover all the stuff. you got to do some pretty nasty stuff, right? You guys have seen pictures of like China and stuff where they do that? Yeah. It's not, not nice. It's not fun because the chemicals, the stuff they use to, to take apart the circuit boards and the electronics, to recycle it, real bad. They'll they'll just take it and instead of pulling off things that are easy to take apart, they'll just stick in the thing and melt it. So all the plastic just burns off, really bad. Lead and the stuff just burns. So don't. So you want to design it so that it's easy to kind of get the good stuff off, then that bad stuff sent to someone else that has a facility that's geared towards taking that stuff apart. <laughs> 
I didn't say that. What? <laughs> no, I didn't. I said they, they do it in China. They do it here too, but it's a lot more expensive here, right? And there's a lot of, and that's why when you buy electronics, you have to pay that electronic recycling fee. Whenever you buy something new, like buy a new TV, you have to pay that recy electronic recycling fee. When you buy it, because they're saying that you're gonna, they're gonna have to pay to, to recycle it later on. And that's used to help the facilities that are doing that. And there's a lot of ones that track to try and keep this electronic stuff here to, to take care of responsibly and not send it to China um, and ruin our atmosphere and they blame it on our cars. Yeah. <laughs> Only if you buy an American car. Yeah. If you buy an import car, it's made here. You might mm -hmm. most likely. What car is actually made in America now? Toyota. Yeah, Toyota. Toyota and Saturn. Honda makes some here. If you buy a Ford, that's not even a symbol here. Chevy, made at the Toyota plant. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it wasn't until they shut the plant down. You know, they, in San Jose, they had the had the Numi plant that had Toyotas and Chevys running right. Toyota, Chevy, Toyota, Chevy, Toyota, Chevy. Exactly the same car, they just put a different batch on it. This is the Corolla and the whatever the Chevy one of those, like Mountain. Yeah, I think so. Same thing with the trucks. Right? Chevy truck, Toyota truck, same truck, different label. Different trim on some things, but put together by the same people with all the same mechanics and stuff. Different options. What else? Incentive to recycle? Yes, an incentive to recycle. So like when I bought my cell phone, the, the manufacturer had a thing where if you send your, your old cell phone back to them, then they'd give you a credit. I got like a $100 credit for sending back my old cell phone. Just because I bought a new one of their phones. Right. Government also does that, right? They don't make it an incentive, they make it a tax, right? Yeah. So the, the electronic recycling tax, when you buy a soda, your can or a bottle, you have to pay the, the recycling, what is it? The recycling redemption value, right? Tax. So, so that you get that back when you recycle it. What else? Anything else? And design for just assembly? No? All right. So here's an example. If you went through the MIT one, you kind of saw this one. Or you should have seen this one. So it says pneumatic piston thing. So it's other piston and a spring. So basically, the spring pushes down the piston in response to, to kind of keep the pressure the same or something like that. Uh, they didn't say what the use was, just this is what it was. The, all this, so they had the piston, they had this ring that went around it, they had the spring, they had this plate, and it was screwed, screwed onto it, right? <clears throat> so then they went through and they redesigned it, make it like that. So now they just put in the piston, they put the spring on it, and you just put a snap cap on it. So instead of having to screw a plate to cover it, now they just snap something in. So the design of this piece here eliminated one, two, three, four other parts. And they changed that. Um, I don't know why they. Oh, so why did they add this thing right there? A replacement spring. 
screw. No? Look at what it says here for number five. I think it's for that cap part to lock in. No. No. So what does five say? Structured access for insertion of spindle. So it means that it's hard to put this into the bottom half of that. Because right, that's a little bit bigger diameter there than it is below. And so it's hard to put that into there. Because you have to pull it from the outside, but then when you get here, you can't hold it by the outside anymore, right? So they made it a little close to the middle, so now you can hold it by the middle and put it in. And on that other one, they also had other things like keeping things so you can you can hold on to it. Um, but not making them too small or too sharp, or making it so that you could get the part in without having to kind of drop it. You ever have to do that? You can't. You have to kind of stick it on the end of the screwdriver and kind of stick it in there. That's easy when it's to the side or up, right? When it's down, it doesn't work. So you have to kind of drop the screw in there and hopefully you get it there and then kind of fish it around until it goes in the hole. Why not make it so you can get to it better? So, so lots of little things with that. Um, making the thing that there's no way for it to bind, it has to go in the right way. So instead, if you got it two different diameters, instead of doing that, have it go down and do a chamfer down to the smaller diameter. So now instead of hanging up here, it'll just kind of slide down. So it changes, that's the design, make the part a little easier to work with. That MIT one had a lot of, Making things so they can't tangle, right? Making so that they're not going to lock together and get stuck. And here's the ones about making it so it's easy to put together. It's not going to get caught up or it'll be hard. screws on something that's easy to get to that screw to to turn to put it in, right? If you ever does something where you can only get a wrench kind of on something and you can only turn it about three degrees. So you're kind of like this and it's hard to reposition. But if they had given you a little bit more clearance on the back side and they could get the wrench all the way on, maybe use the box end of it. Or if they moved out you can have some more clearance. Or a screwdriver where you can't go vertical, you have to go at an angle mm -hmm. to get to it. Stuff like that. So taking account of that. Um, got this nice little screw chart that I've had forever since I started working. That on the back. It has some things for, for rinse uh, space. So by picking a half inch wrench, you can't really see that. 
but that tells me the center should be spaced 0.74 inches apart at least. The space from there to the wall should be at least 0.45. If I want to use a socket, I need at least 0.81 diameters hole for it. Um, if I'm using the open inside, I need at least 0.52 from the center to the wall to go to, to move it. <clears throat> so having something like that, it tells you kind of those measurements. This is a good, nice, nice handy thing. Otherwise, you have to take, take a wrench and measure it and see. Okay, this is the tool I want to use to, to service this. How am I going to do that? What, what measurements do I need to be able to get that in there? And then it gets overlooked a lot, right? So if you can show an employer that you can take that into consideration, you know to look at that stuff. You know to, to talk to the guys out in the shop that are actually going to make the part. Or you've been the guy in the shop that knows how to make the part. Then it makes you a little bit more valuable because now you're not going to design something that can't be made. Right? Because you can design whatever you want. You can make it on one of those. Whatever you want. It doesn't mean you can make it with the CNC or with the EDM or a lathe or whatever, right? <clears throat> so that's the difference between a, an engineer and a good engineer or a designer. So what's the difference between an engineer and designer? Engineer knows math. Yeah. <laughs> Engineers finished it and knows math. Designer does most of the same type of work. Um, it's more concerned with how it's going to go together and the drawings and things. The engineer does the mechanisms to make sure that it's going to move correctly. Any math for strength or fatigue or those kinds of calculations. But usually they'll work hand in hand. Um, and you can be called an engineer without being an engineer. Um, there's some jobs that you don't have to be an engineer to do. Still have that title, like I was an industrial engineer. But I didn't have an engineer back, or I didn't go to school for engineering. I did industrial technology. But I knew manufacturing processes and how things go together and how, what that was. So that's what an industrial engineer does. So don't get caught up in titles um, too much. On the on the window, there's a nice little description of what on the, the window outside. There's a little description about what a product designer does, and that's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, questions? So you can't work hand in hand with an engineer. So basically, product designer. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Engineers are more are considered the big picture, how it's going to work, safety, things like that.